Andreas. Okay. All right. Um, where's my, is my first, oh, here the clock is running. So it's my first time here at Hackware, and after hearing Mihail uh, talk about something that I understand a little bit, um, I hope I'm right here <laughs> with what I have prepared. Um, so my background is in the arts uh, and design, but um, I've been working with uh, software and hardware for quite a long time, and um, I, I use it in my practice. So I write software, I've been doing this for a couple of years. Um, I uh, make hardware, uh, not very high tech like this, but very low tech, you will see that in a bit. And I think I will talk a little bit about the in-between the arts and uh, technology. Um, I teach at LaSalle. Uh, I also run a small lab at LaSalle, um, the Media Lab. And it's uh, mostly about using technology within an art practice. It's about collaboration and uh, it's about uh, making art with technology. Just a few examples. Um, that's how our teaching space looks like. Um, I think what, what is very important for me or what I have figured out over the years is that uh, uh, you have to work together as a team, you have to gather around the table and you have to put all the stuff on the table and uh, just figure out uh, 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 what all these things, especially electronics are. Um, we work a lot with Arduino boards, so I think again after seeing these boards here, I think for you guys that is like uh, children's toys, but uh, um, I think we have been quite successful in, in getting students interested in technology using these boards. In terms of materials, um, um, yeah, we use a lot of uh, electronics, but very big electronics, not very small electronics. Uh, so listening to Mihail earlier, I thought, you know, you guys probably use tweezers and uh, I would use a hammer in the, instead, you know. So I <laughs> think we work in, in, in larger dimensions, I guess. Um, Prototyping and developing everything from scratch for me is very important and uh, I also try to uh, pass it on to my students uh, to build with what is available, to build with very cheap materials that can be wood, that can be cardboard, that can be yeah, what is just available, maybe an art friend. And um, I try to um, convince them that you can make great things with it. So this is my Arduino collection. There's more, but I'm very proud of the Induino, the, little, the, the big thing there in the, in the background. One of my students brought it back from India when he was visiting home, and it's like really double the size of a normal Arduino and comes with big parts. Um, and of course, uh, we work with, with Raspberry Pis and uh, other um, systems on the chip. Uh, ESP8266 I'm very excited about, so I think these are not uh, really... Uh, um, um, foreign islands for us, so we're trying to get <laughs> on the train of this constant development of technology. I think I have to say, I came here in 2008, and uh, when I asked our finance department to buy some Arduino boards, they were like, what, 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 what do you want to do? Arduino, Ardu Arduino, and they couldn't even pronounce the name. Um, and I think after these uh, seven years that I've been here now, or almost eight years, uh, that, that definitely has changed, so people know now what is an Arduino board and I think this is also due to the community, so um, I think that, that's really a big, big uh, component in Singapore that promotes technology which, as I said, eight, seven years ago really didn't, that didn't exist, even though I speak of the arts, but uh, uh, um, yeah, now with... Uh, 12 gigs and uh, all these online shops so for, for, for students that's really great to get into electronics and uh, have access to it. Just two projects that I, uh, I like. Um, 2008, Ong Kiang Peng um, made, made this device which he calls a flat helmet and uh, it's the visor which is hollow uh, inside and uh, on his backpack, back then there were no mobile phones, so he had to use, well, I think today you can really compress it into maybe a quarter of the size. So he was carrying this backpack with his laptop, with a water pump, and um, um, he mapped his location, his physical location against the map that he got from the NUS uh, water department, 
which predicted the water rise in Singapore in the next 50 years or in 50 years. So he was, would walk around with his visor and whenever he <laughs> Uh, got to a location where uh, the predicted water level would rise, so the blue water in his visor would rise. So it's kind of, <laughs> kind of a um, this real time on the side uh, um, visualization of uh, something quite scary uh, which might or could happen in the next 50 years. Another project is by uh, Mitro Vigneshwara. Uh, um, who built this little device that, that kind of looks like a camera um, but is an object that you can point in uh, any direction and it uh, returns uh, the emotional states of cities that are within the, what is it called, within the radar, the field. field of view um, of, of the camera. Um, A little device, uh, custom built, laser cut, Arduino board inside, uh, uh, compass inside. Uh, at the back, you could slot in uh, your mobile phone and then connect through uh, Bluetooth uh, to the Arduino board. Uh, and then the compass um, would tell you yeah, when, which direction are you looking at, and then the data would be displayed on the display. Um, the data was collected uh, from Twitter over 30 days and then evaluated based on keywords like happy, sad, uh, aggressive and so on. Uh, there were eight, eight different categories and uh, just some of the data collected you see here. And interestingly, where you cannot see it, but uh, South America turned out to be very aggressive. Hong Kong and Singapore turned out to be quite boring. So <laughs> there's seven lines, so each line <laughs> represents uh, one day per week. <laughs> and uh, Hong Kong is, uh, yeah, not even the weekends get exciting, yeah, so every day is kind of the same. Singapore kind of looks the same. Buenos Aires on the other side is very aggressive, yeah, a lot of uh, uh, purple. Uh, Jerusalem um, was the only city who's, which was very anticipating, um, probably has a bright future ahead. So. I mean, these projects, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, I think they, they, they might not have, like I said earlier, they might not have these values that, or data that you um, uh, pick up with a tweezer, so it's more like, you know, with a chisel and a hammer. So the data is quite raw, but I think uh, the idea or just coming up with this idea and making it happen and making it show to the world or showing it to the world, I think that's what I appreciate and that's also what I try to convince my students to do. Teaching, um, I have one class that is called electro, electro sounds. So I teach that to music technology uh, students, and uh, when they come to me, they don't have any technical software hardware background. They play an instrument. They're interested in electronic music. They're interested in their their effects, and they're quite good at that. But when they come to me, so. They have heard of an Arduino board, but they haven't touched one, um, or they haven't programmed one, or they haven't worked with one. Um, so what I do with them then is we build our own instruments. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important to not educate in a very gen generic way. To say, here you have an Arduino board, here you have the Blink uh, example, here you have other examples, and then just go through the, uh, through the books. I figured it's, it's very important to relate it to the practice, to one's practice. So I teach fine arts, I teach design, I teach music technology. Um, and for each of these different disciplines, I have to adjust my teaching methods and I have to adjust um, to um, their practice and to their interest. Otherwise, um, I fail. <laughs> so I think it's very important that students really can relate to what they make, that they can relate to uh, what they use in order to make this very dry and very scary uh, uh, subject uh, interesting. Uh, surprisingly, most of the students come to the arts because they didn't like the science. So <laughs> they come to come to my class and then they, you know, uh, have to write software or make hardware. Um, hey, that, that's why we, we use these lead shields. <laughs> 
Uh, just, just one example, um, that's an uh, electro zither, so uh, adapted from the, uh, from, from the instrument zither. Um, that's ZIG, um, and uh, that's his instrument. It's a lot of noise. I think this is how, 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 you, how you experience the technology that you build. That's how you figure out, okay, if I do that, that this happens, if I do that, that happens. Um, these are early experiments, so after a while that gets much more fine-tuned and much more sophisticated. But students are also exposed to uh, making their own uh, instruments using physical materials. Today students come with a laptop and a lot of students uh, think everything happens in the laptop. So when I tell them, hey, we, you know, but we get a little bit physical, we have to really use our hands to make, uh, um, in this case, an instrument, um, then some of them haven't even touched some wood tools before. I think which is not bad, but uh, if you expose them to the workshop that we have at Lazar, uh, they get uh, quite happy and they're quite happy that they build something with their own hands and uh, uh, laser cut something with their uh, own, um, not with their own hands, not with their own lasers, but uh, you know, they, they initiated, initiated that process. Um, very important, I feel, is to have a public presentation uh, where you present the tools or the instruments, in this case, that you have built. In that case, that's the Art Science Museum. They have this monthly events, which I think, I don't know, has anyone been there, uh, where they invite schools NUS, NTU, uh, Polytex, to present student works and uh, I think for students that's a great uh, exercise and great exposure in order to show their works. <coughs> and also to get feedback. I have eight minutes left, so I, I just flipped through these images because I want to show something else. Uh, very important for me uh, is light and wood as a material. So I think looking back at my work over the past five years, I really have used that, uh, uh, these materials excessively. So wood for me is really easy to work with. I can cut it, it's very solid. Uh, I can build uh, large, uh, big, big sculptures, installations. Um, I can unscrew them, I can pack them, I can uh, yeah, do a lot of stuff with it. And lights uh, coming from a screen-based background, I think lights is still the closest to where I came from. It illuminates the space, uh, it uh, creates uh, emotions, and that's why I really like to use LED lights. i just show a few uh, videos that hopefully don't need any more explanation. So from a small model, then uh, to a prototype, and then uh, to the sculpture. It's part of uh, one larger work. That's the socket. Uh, so it's A3. Um, <laughs> strangely, we defaulted back to breadboards. I think we find it really easier <laughs> to replace parts or to quickly modify the circuit. Uh, we tried uh, prototyping boards, uh, soldering, um, night sessions of soldering. Uh, yeah. It just didn't turn out so well, <laughs> so we it back to breadboards, and I think breadboards actually is a quite great. It's a, it's a great material for the things, at least that I do. And then, uh, yeah, from the small prototyping box or model, it kind of got applied in many different applications over the past three years: uh, installations, site-specific installations. Theater performances as a stage design, uh, sound performances at the Art Science Museum, again La Salle. And now we are preparing uh, another collaboration together with the dance department uh, for the Night Fest. And these are the initial tests for this new setup. I want to 
want to talk, yeah, the last five minutes I want to spend talking about a project called Urban Explorations, uh, which started in 2012. And uh, uh, I just came back in June uh, from Paris, where we did the set second edition of the Urban Explorations project. <coughs> uh, the Urban Explorations project um, is a project that yeah, looks like an urban environment. Uh, we built our own tools to sense that urban environment, to sample that urban environment, bring back the data, kind of try to make sense of it, and create an artifact from it that we then uh, exhibit. Um, in Paris, we spent five weeks um, conceptualizing, building, evaluating, and exhibiting uh, our works. Uh, these are two works that have been built, one Ong Kyang Peng on the left. Is it the left? On the left, he built a 12-channel uh, sound recorder uh, that he would just put up in different locations in the city and um, collect sound intensities that would come from different directions. And then he would build small uh, sound sculptures from it. On the right, that's uh, my colleague Patrick Kochlik from Berlin. He built um, um, a uh, yeah, frequency sensor. It's basically a DB... Uh, DB, DB DVBT, DVBT yes. uh, antenna that allows you to scan uh, the frequency spectrum. It starts at, I think, 800 megahertz and then goes up all the way to 1800 megahertz, 1.8 gigahertz. Um, so he would just go around in the city, <coughs> set up his little antenna, and then collect uh, data for 30 minutes. And these are all nine. Uh, tools or instruments, data collection instruments that we have been we built. Um, top left, Wei Sin, uh, she just went around sampling whatever is on the floor and uh, putting it into, into her bags and her suitcase. Uh, then the second one, that's Ong Kyang Peng, um, 12 channel sound recording device. On the right, that's a pigeon camera. Um, so it's a platform with um, uh, a few buttons. And whenever, whenever a pigeon would come uh, and press one of those buttons or initiate um, these buttons, a photo would, would be taken of these pigeons. Uh, second row on the left, um, that's my project that we'll talk about in a second. Patrick's in the center. On the right, that's Cindy's uh, snail lab. <laughs> she would go around in, in uh, Paris and look for snail, uh, snails. Uh, look at their pH values, uh, bring them back into the studio, big mess. Um, no, it, it was great. Um, and uh, yeah, work with snails she would find in, uh, in Paris. Bottom left, that's um, an extension for a mobile phone. Uh, it's a magnifying glass or a microscopic, uh, with a microscopic lens. Um, the next one, it's a, it's a stethoscope for uh, listening to buildings. There's a piezo sensor, and you just put it uh, yeah, on top of buildings, put on your stethoscope, and then uh, wait until it starts moving. And some of them actually did move, um, or data was recorded. And then the last one, the shoes. Um, the heel, you can take off the heel, and then it's hollow, so you can put in some uh, sensors. And the whole idea was to put in some sensors, and uh, collect data while you were walking. Um, these are the nine projects that we uh, created over a period of three weeks. And I will just talk a little bit about my project, uh, Movement of Things. And um, it's about this little chip here, um, which I'm quite excited about. I think you guys, oh, I have one minute left. I will, I will, yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> Uh, this little chip was designed by uh, a French startup called Tangible Display. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this guy, uh, Cedric. Yeah. Um, he's he's, he's still 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 a hacker. Hacker. Sorry? He's he's still 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 all right, all right. Um, so I met him here in, in Singapore and I, I was quite excited about this little chip. So it just runs off a cell battery. Um, no wires involved. There's an accelerometer, magnetometer. Uh, it gives you six values. Uh, acceleration XYZ and orientation XYZ and um, I thought that was 
great for what I wanted to do to record the movement of things. Uh, I could just uh, use this little chip, attach it to different objects. In this case, it's a piece of plastic, a roll, quite heavy. And uh, you will see that later in the video. I would just roll uh, that piece of plastic along different surfaces and then record the data that these surfaces, uh, surfaces would uh, uh, resonate to. Um, it advertises Bluetooth LE, so it just sends out data. Uh, the data is uh, included in the description of the chip, <coughs> so you don't need a connection, so you just turn this thing on. You have, in this case, an Android application running that just lis listens for these advertising messages, and then uh, you just snap the data and, and record it or display it, like in this case. So that's how I would run around in the, in the city. Uh, this guy attached to six different uh, microcontroller extensions, I would call them, uh, for different purposes, and then have my mobile phone record the data. That was my favorite, so this air vent <laughs> with all the metro air coming out, and that was ex very strong. Um, the tool that I built here is just a plastic bag from a shop, uh, nylon strings, and uh, uh, what's that called? A uh, backhoe. Uh, and that's the data that I got back um, displayed as a graph, time, six lines, XYZ acceleration. Uh, I have a close-up. XYZ acceleration and then orientation at the bottom. That's from uh, a water canal. Um, but of course, that, that's not very pretty to me. <laughs> that's uh, too raw. So then I, I tried to find method. Oh, I'm running out of time. I ran out of time. <laughs> um, I just go through some images that show how I kind of beautify the data or make them uh, uh, pretty or beautiful myself. How I translate this whole experience into small little... Um, exhibition objects. Again the plastic bag, then the helicopter we found on the streets and then a ping sensor uh, just to activate the helicopter. Um, that's, uh, that piece is called X versus uh, Y. So I took the Y channel and the X uh, channel of uh, a data set and then played them back using a stepper motor and I had these feelers and uh, they're nice moments when they kind of wiggle or when they touch each other or when they move fast and uh, are very hectic or very calm. So these are kind of translations of the data into something it might be a little bit too abstract, but uh, kind of resonates uh, my experience or the experience of that process. So that's the exhibition. And, uh, these are some shots from the exhibition, and I'm done. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Your students uh, last year had some projects there, so this year they're having as well. Which project was it? Um, no, I think that was Isla. Uh, La Salle. La Salle. They're everywhere. 
<laughs> no, but but I like the I like festival, but that's yeah. already like three or four years ago. Uh, we had a we had a piece there. Um, it's a night festival. We we're gonna be at the deck. I don't know if you guys know that it's a photography space, exhibition space, right across from Lazada. So it's containers, stack containers, and they converted that into an exhibition space. So we're gonna have two containers there, and we're gonna have a performance using boxes, wooden boxes, uh, light strips, LED light strips, and uh, the twist. Cool. <laughs> Questions for uh, Yes, so please. How do you get to ask this <laughs> when, when do you even start? Well, first of all, they have to take the class. Yeah. Um, then um, I, I start, I, first I started using processing software. Uh, screen-based uh, outcomes, um, but I feel that working with an Arduino board, I mean the language is the same, almost the same, uh, makes it easier to pick up these principles of you know, these languages or object-oriented programming. Um, so usually we, sta we start with an Arduino board, uh, we go through some of these examples just to get the basics uh, um, down, and then um, they either build instruments, like in the electrosounds class, I have another class called Drawing Machines, so they build drawing machines uh, in, in fine arts. Um, when I work with dancers, uh, all the work is on my plate, so there is more about, it's, it's more about feedback, so what does the dancer, uh, what does <laughs> she want to do, and how can we work something out so that she can do it. Um, but yeah, so usually I start with Arduino. And uh, I also teach a class then in processing, uh, so that's usually the path of getting them into coding. It's called the Twiz, T W I Z, uh, Twiz.io. It's by Tangible Display, so it's a small startup from Paris, <laughs> and they have a very funny studio in the suburbs of, uh, okay. of Paris. Um, I think it's not in production. No, it's not in production. Um, so, thankfully, I got a couple of them uh, uh, to work with and experiment with. Um, but I think they're also very excited to see, okay, what, what can you do as an artist that uh, um, looks maybe a little bit different than from what maybe a demo, an engineering demo would look like. Um, so, I think we had very good discussions and um, good exchange. And uh, yeah, so let's see what uh, this dance project, uh, what will come out of this dance project using this. <coughs> All right. Um, if not, uh, thank you, Andres. We hope to see some more people showing their work in the next couple of days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, on an individual basis. So I think I would also be interested what your perspective is on how artists or designers could come into you know, your domain. Um, um, and yeah, maybe I just leave that here. Absolutely. Thank you so much.